Hello and welcome to Taking Liberties Radio. My name is Lee. I'm in WA this week. We are on episode 35 of season five and I'm joined by a uh, former longtime host, now editor-in-chief at The Unshackled, uh, Tim Wilms. Hi, Lee. Good to be back. And it's good that uh, Taking Liberties is well, now in its uh, fifth year. It's good yeah. that you've kept that out. Uh, thanks. Yeah. And I, I have to praise your studio. I, I It's very, very professional. I feel with my uh, office in the background is uh, somewhat... Uh, inadequate compared to what you got going on there so it looks uh, it's it's a lot more than when i first uh was on taking liberties it was my f- first foray into the the internet uh media so uh i i was just in my home background but yep. yeah i've slow uh, little steps to upgrade yes uh, and definitely you guys have got a much uh, a very big operation and we'll cover that later because i'd be i'm sure our listeners would love to hear what you got going on but this week we're going to talk about two topics we're going to talk about scomo and immigration and we're going to talk about the the uh, law the uh trans law that was passed in tasmania i don't know i can't remember if it's been going through the upper house yet but it's gone through the lower house there uh, but let's start off with immigration uh so scott morrison has uh promised that there will be a cut of 30,000 people to the uh, the immigration intake, like the cap that the federal government has. Uh, I don't think he gave a time frame, but presumably next year. Uh, the explicit rationale that he gave was that of uh, congestion and overcrowding in uh, particularly Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Tim, you are in Melbourne. Are you awash with immigrants? Um, well, I commute to uh, work here in the, the studio most days, yeah. and I deliberately make sure that I don't arrive here during peak hour. Otherwise, I'll spend an hour to an hour and a half in the city, and I'm I just have to take uh, one freeway. So it is de- definitely is uh, real. There's there's nothing worse than being uh, stuck in traffic, seeing the the, the delays ahead. So yes, mm. it's it's not just pe- things that people rant about on the internet. It's it's very real, and like I said, I've had to adjust my my work schedule to make sure I'm leaving home when it's not peak hour, and then coming back later when it's when it's not peak hour. So yes, it's I, I can attest that it, it is an issue. Okay, well, I, I mean, I guess we're gonna have a, some disagreements. So how about you lay out like what's your argument in favor of the cut? So before I, and and then we'll sort of go into maybe my skepticism and and we'll sort of go back and forth. So why? Why is this going to actually, you know, how is this going to solve the problem? Do you think it's going to solve the problem? Do you think it's token? Like, what's your kind of general take on, on, uh, on the Well, let's stick with the, the infrastructure issue with regards to immigration for the time being. So our current ceiling is $190,000. Uh, so, sorry, so 190,000 people, <laughs> people <laughs> per, per year. And... They're all going into mainly Sydney and Melbourne, some of the other uh, major cities. And I live out in the the southeast of Melbourne and there's constantly more houses being built, more roads uh, being built. And it it looks looks like that, because we're in a state election here in Victoria, mm. the, the Daniel Andrews government are saying, look at uh, all this uh, infrastructure we've built, but they're, they're only just keeping up with what growth we're, uh, we're getting in here mm. so so basically it's it's what termed is is an immigration ponzi scheme because mm. the the immigrants come in the the government gets to, to build uh the infrastructure and say hey look at what we've done but of course government and you're a libertarian being uh the mismanagers that they are these yep. projects they always come in uh over budget especially if you've got a labor uh, government then you've got all the the unions they'll they'll get all their 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 sweetheart deals and so as i as i mentioned before congestion is still uh, just as bad the, the old joke is you extend the freeway by two lanes they automatically uh, f- fill up again so yeah, absolutely the, the reality that we're in is that for further immigration to australia governments uh, given their their track record they have to uh, keep uh, keep up with the, the infrastructure provide all the services and as you and i know they're just not capable of doing that sure but i mean uh, so my argument would be that they wouldn't be able to handle it if there was zero immigrants coming in like the issue is not immigration i mean thirty thousand people sounds like a lot but it's you know point zero zero one two of the population of Australia. So it's not a huge, you know, to, to have that 30,000 extra people, it's not a huge increase on the overall population. And even if it's going to Sydney and Melbourne, like that's still, there's still big cities. It's still a drop in the bucket. 
you know, if if these systems are being mismanaged, it's because they're being mismanaged. Like it's not because you know, you you know, if you have 160,000 people, we're going to be, you know, come in, we're going to be fine. But if you have 160,000 and one person, all of a sudden chaos is going to reign. You know, like, so it's really, it's, it's, it's very much a case that even if you had zero immigrants, you would still have government mismanaging. Like that is a separate issue from immigration. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I agree that governments, regardless of, uh, of how many people we would take in are going to find ways to stuff things up uh, regardless. But the thing is, we don't need to make it so that they can stuff up even even further. And, and, and that's my argument here. Why are we continuing to bring all these people here when we know that government can't even manage things as they are? Why would we just pile on the, the work on top of that? Uh, because it's a very marginal amount of work. Like, it's not, you know, like, uh, I mean, leaving aside where these people are going, what exactly they're doing, you know, like that, that's, I think that's a relevant question. Like if, if this 30,000 people, if only a thousand of them are actually going to drive into the CBD of Sydney or Melbourne every day because they're, you know, lawyers or doctors or whatever, you know, I mean, that's a, that's relevant. Uh, but leaving that aside, assuming that all 30,000 have an impact on, on this, the infrastructure that is burnt, you know, is overwhelmed. It's still a very small amount and the cost, but the cost to the people involved. So, you know, I mean, I guess it's not, uh, I'm not an immigration policy expert. It'd be, uh, I suspect that this, this cap is separate from say family reunions. And there's probably a number of other categories that don't fit in that cap. Um, but the cost to those people, and actually, if you think about the cost of the community in terms of what those people provide and what those people bring, you know, that's actually quite a large cost, which I presume SCOMO is not being like going to put down and figure out, you know, what is going to be the cost if we don't, you know, if the next Elon Musk doesn't make it over from, you know, Sri Lanka to Australia, like he can't measure that cost. Uh, but that cost is is a real cost. You know, every person that do- can't come here and take make use of the laws, make use of all of all the, inf- you know, the uh, infrastructure uh, institutions that we have, that's that's a cost that we bear. I'll first address you're talking about 30,000 cut that the SCOMO's introduced is insignificant. Well, I think that SCOMO's chosen the the 30,000 because uh, it's the uh, the least the the most tokenistic gesture he can uh, do uh, on, on this issue. Because let's not remember that six months ago when Tony Abbott proposed reducing it to 110,000 uh, a year, I nearly yep. said dollars again. I don't know why. I'm <laughs> but that's fine for the benefit of everybody's watching. You can pass what he's saying. So, and Scott Morrison was the one who strongly uh, came out against it, saying sure. that it would wreck the wreck, wreck the budget. And I don't recall any conversation I had with with Tony Abbott about this. Basically, yes. trying to dump on Tony Abbott as much as possible. But uh, uh, Scott Morrison, basically, when he's in his prime ministership, everything's been a thought bubble, like the embassy, sure. for example, and so. And he hasn't actually committed. He said that it will probably drop yeah, by thirty thousand. It's like, yeah. well, I don't know whether it <laughs> will or not. Yeah, it's, exactly. It, it, it's going to be up to some other guy. I mean, yep. uh, which which basically sums up his prime ministership. There's there's nothing except what the, sums the, up the, the prime ministerships of a lot of people so far that we've had since John Howard. There's a lot of that going on. Well, this one's particularly empty in my opinion, but okay. uh, going on to what you were saying that you, you I, I know from, cause I know you, you well, you, you believe that we are enriched um, by yeah. uh, immigration, but I, and of course I, I don't uh, deny that there are good immigrants, but we are having way too many problems at the moment with uh, some of the, the immigrants uh, coming here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm here in Melbourne where we've had the, the African youth gang crime crisis, which is uh, uh, really causing trouble and fear in selected areas of Melbourne, such as Tarnay, Wyndham Vale, uh, Cranbourne, uh, Officer. Uh, so the, the, those people in those areas, they're, they're, they're not feeling the enrichment and I'm not, not being facetious. Yeah, no, I, 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 that. That, I mean, that, that's a legitimate concern. Like, you know, if I was in those areas and I felt like there was a problem with, you know, young immigrant men coming over and causing a problem, I, I could totally, even me as a libertarian, like I can understand how somebody would feel like that. So like, I think that's a legitimate 
thing to feel. Um, I mean, whether this actual cut gets to that. And, and maybe we can transition to the politics of it. Because, I mean, I think you kind of alluded to it before. There's an election, Victoria. I'd, you know, and, and surprisingly, uh, this, this and Matthew Guy, from my perception as an outsider, he kind of seems to be a bit on the conservative side of the kind of Liberal Party. Maybe you can sort of feel, you know, correct me if I'm wrong there. But certainly, like, his approach to drugs, for example, he's coming at it from a, kind of a pretty hardline conservative stance. And, and uh, uh, you know... A liberal, his liberal mates in the federal party have come along in the middle of this perceived, you know, uh, immigration crisis in Melbourne. He comes along with the immigration argument. So, like, do you think? What do you think about the politics of it? Like, do you think this is just politics? Um, time to the the Victorian election, or you know, what's your take on that? Perhaps, but not many people have actually made. Uh, that link. And uh, uh, let's not remember that Scott Morrison is also saying this because of public pressure. I mean, you see the polls. There was a, a poll released uh, by the Centre for Independent yes. Studies this week, which <laughs> showed that both uh, people in affluent and low income areas in the major cities, majority of them wanted uh, immigration paused until infrastructure can catch up. So this is not... Uh, uh, politicians dog whistling to, to to people they're reacting to in fact they've been the, the last people to actually want to do something about this because of what i mentioned before they get to build the infrastructure they get all the revenue in so it's it, 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 it's not a uh conspiracy by the politicians no, the, no, no, sure and uh, of course uh, we had the uh terrorist attack in melbourne a couple mm. of weeks ago that's really uh, concerned people then the 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 raids uh just uh this week so and because uh, you know that i uh, associate with a lot of uh nationalist people who are more on the tough on crime thing and they actually they actually think that you know matthew guy he's he's not going far enough he's weak sure. he, he won't he won't address the uh, uh address the the crime crisis by uh what it is he uh, scott morrison is not going as far on islam as they they would like yeah. so uh politicians they're they're still keeping it very pc yeah well i mean i guess the nature of like even the you know i mean tony abbott uh i mean it was, there's a lot to say about tony abbott and his oh, prime, prime ministership <laughs> but no, no no just just in terms of like you know tony abbott it, like there's a number of aspects to his prime ministership but certainly how he he would like to portray himself as is this you know hardline right-wing warrior but like when he was prime minister like it would it would be hard to say that he was like really like some sort of like a, like massive conservative like you know oh, yeah. of, he remember. was not the he was not the boogeyman that like you know uh like you know thatcher on ice like as as the left would have you believe um you know, I mean, even like, I think Donald Trump, you could argue with was like far more right wing, even though he himself is not like a Bible, you know, like he's not this sort of conservative Christian type. He's probably more right wing than Tony Abbott ever was. So, I mean, I, I, I think just in terms of how politics operates in Australia, the f far right and the far left in terms of kind of the main parties, generally those who are in leadership are not going to be that far from the center. Like they're still going to be pretty centrist, just with some sort of tendencies to sort of be a bit more... You know, I mean, yeah, I, I think that's probably roughly how it works. So Matthew, you know, to go back to the case of Matthew Guy, like he might talk tough on some things, but in the end, he's going to be more or less centrist just because that's how the system works here. Uh, I would probably say the far left are getting a, a, a bit more of what they want, well, especially here in Victoria, than what the you know far right can can ever uh, dream of. So I think certainly one side is sort of getting a a, a bit more from the the centre, as you put it. Yep. Um, there was something else you mentioned that I was going to pick up on, but I can't remember what it was. Um, anyway, well, uh, any final thoughts on? Um, oh, yeah. Any final thoughts on that one? Maybe we'll move on. Uh, any is there any like? Okay, let's let's say say you were the immigration minister. Okay, Skoma comes to you and says, "Tim, please, I need your help. I beg you. What are we going to do? What what would be like? Uh, we've sort of what what would be your approach to sort of approach the stated issue of congestion in immigration? Would you cut further? Um, is thirty thousand enough? Let's cut by half to to start with. Okay. That would, I think, certainly, well, communicate to the public that uh, you're serious about uh, 
tackling this this issue and there there's also been the the talk about having migrants uh, settle in the regions but yeah. uh, i'm not exactly sure how this could this could be enforced given that if you are in a country you should have freedom of movement throughout that mm. uh, country and there's been talked about that there'd, there'd be certain uh tax benefits to for them to, to be in the regions but then you're sort of getting into the field of migrants getting an advantage that ordinary australians uh don't get so i'm not sold on on that sort of uh, idea but i think s slowing it significantly is a a good way to way to start uh certainly uh, despite what what some people would uh, say of me i'm i'm not in favor of um of com uh, completely uh, ending our uh, non-discriminatory um, immigration uh, policy. I, I certainly think that from some regions of the world, we we definitely uh, need to pause it uh, from there. But there's a lot of reasons why, for example, the um, the African crime crisis in in Melbourne. Uh, it, it's not just that. Uh, the reason that that's happening is because we're letting a whole bunch of people in from Africa. It's a it's a variety of things such as the the, the court system uh, treating African migrants different from ordinary Australian criminals. If, uh, I I know that you you don't uh, think too much of the the tough on crime thing, but I've actually spoken to uh, corrections uh, people who said that for these young people sometimes jail is the best thing for them because they learn if they've done something really wrong then they're going to prison then they they have access to those uh, rehabilitation programs so sometimes in prison it not only sends a message but it's where they can get the the most help to to turn their lives ar around so uh that's also a it's a law and order issue of actually treating people differently uh, we, uh, which is not what we're supposed to be. So if we just had a colorblind approach to law and order and uh, didn't give all these special consideration because that's what really breeds resentment, especially in Melbourne when there's an article saying that this uh, African teenage thug got a, uh, a suspended sentence, the, the judge said, oh, they were just uh, troubled. That's, that's what's really... Uh, driving resentment and so there's a lot we can we can do uh, in the the justice area just to fix what is perceived to be an immigration problem sure. okay i mean the tough just to go the tough on crime thing my opposition to it is usually because tough on crime means what i i don't think what you're saying but i think what a lot of people would think which is less discretion for judges so you brought up a news article uh, in, in you know in Melbourne about a, a person who was said to be dis, you know disturbed or whatever you know we get them in WA as well we have a similar sort of I mean basically I think everywhere in the Western world you have a similar sort of thing where you know there is a particularly egregious case and then tough on crime essentially comes in and says well let's take away that discretion I mean I think the issue with it is uh, if you give you know that a policy that is tailored to fix a singular case. By eliminating discretion has an impact on lots of other cases where you would probably if if it was publicized you would want discretion you know you end up in situations you know perfect example is mandatory minimums you see everywhere be it australia or the us some poor guy he got busted for the third time with weed and he's facing years in prison because that's just how the, the rules work so i mean i, I guess I mean, we're getting away from immigration, but I mean, I, I, yeah. it's it's the complex. You know, often these these issues are boiled down into very simplistic ways. Uh, you know, and sometimes maybe that kid in that instance really should have got a tough. Like, I'm not saying in every instance somebody where somebody's got a lenient sentence they deserve a lenient sentence. I just think uh, you know, there's a lot of cases that go through the courts, and it's very easy to say, oh, these judges, man, they're just too soft. Uh, when, 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 when there's this, when, you know, where there's like lots of people who like, they don't see all the other cases that are going through the system. Most of our politicians are only talking about mandatory minimums for violent offenses where you basically have a, a terrorized victim. I mean, you're talking about the US thing where they, they find an ounce of marijuana on, on some kid and then throw, uh, throw the book at them. Of yeah. course, that is ridiculous. That's a nonviolent uh, offense. That's that's not what we're talking about. Or if they've you know just stolen a bottle of iced coffee from the lo local supermarket, yeah. it's wrong. But it doesn't 
justify them automatically going to jail. I mean, uh, th there's a lot more that you can sort of do to deter uh, somebody from that. But when it's it's such a violent of offence, such as a a home invasion or a, or a carjacking, sure. yeah. there, there's, uh, there, uh, when judges are still able to, in the, in the public's view, make excuses uh, to... To, uh, to to basically uh, ra uh, rationalize uh, what they did then I th that's that's what we're talking about here those those really terrifying incidents okay well the thing I remembered I was going to bring up was the Center for Independent Studies thing I think there's some interesting discussion there but we'll maybe move on because we've only got 10 more minutes let's talk about the Tasmania train issue tra trans issue so the <laughs> The uh, the lower house in Tasmania, uh, basically in opposition to the government. So the uh, Speaker of the House, who was kind of a, a disaffected liberal, teamed up, uh, supported a, a amendments by the Greens and by Labor to uh, amend a piece of legislation. So the, the original legislation was, if you get divorced, you don't have to... Uh, sorry, if you want to change your gender, you don't have to get divorced first. So if you want to come out of, you know, change, you know, you're a man becoming a woman, at least in terms of the, the paperwork... Uh, you don't need to get divorced, which, I mean, I think most people would hopefully think that's sensible. And then Labor and the Greens tacked on a bunch of amendments, uh, some of which I think is good, some of which are less good, but it included, uh, you know, that 16-year-olds only need to file a statutory declaration to change their gender. There was a, a inclusion of kind of gender identity to hate speech laws. Um, yeah, so there's a few, there's a, sort of a package. It's still going to go through the upper house, but there's independents who kind of hold the ballot, so it could still pass. Tim, what are your thoughts? Well, it's an extreme piece of legislation. Most of it uh, has centered on the fact that uh, gender on a birth certificate is now opt-in. So basically... I yes, that was... That, sorry, that was the big one. Yeah, sorry. I, I yeah, can't, I've that, totally overlooked that one. I shouldn't yeah. say midwife, but mid-person yeah. now <laughs> ask the parents, uh, do you want gender recorded on the, the birth certificate? And I don't think it's going to hit parents that they're, they're going to be like, what? You... Yeah, you have to ask me uh, to, uh, to do that. It, it, basically, and we're we're told that our uh, gender and sex is not uh, removed completely from from records. Uh, it's still going to be on on medical uh, records. So that obviously, what people uh, people are most concerned about is how can you treat uh, somebody as a doctor if you have no information on on what gender they are. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason why this birth certificate thing has been uh, quite an obsession for the, um, the trans uh, community is because the fact that to, uh, when you have to prove your identity to, to get certain things, a lot of the time there's a birth certificate. And if you come in as a woman and uh, your birth certificate says you're a man, it's a bit awkward. Uh, sure. that, that's sort of where this whole thing uh, started. But basically, this uh, this push has gone way off the deep end by the, this self-identification that if, if somebody says they're the opposite gender or a non-binary gender, you have to uh, accept that. And the law has to accept that as well. Let's not remember all it takes is a statutory declaration to change uh, your gender now. And of course, we saw the... National Senator Barry O'Sullivan take this to as logical conclusion, saying, "I'm a woman now. You you have to accept it. These are your rules." And so we're really seeing this, uh, the extreme transgender and I'd say non-binary activists really go over the top. And I know for a fact that they're annoying a lot of just ordinary trans people who just want to get on with their their lives and, in fact, want gender on their birth certificate because to affirm. Who they are and so a, a fringe lobby group has now managed to create legislation in the state of Victor the state of tasmania uh, okay well i couldn't really disagree more uh i mean most of this has got to do with navigating bureaucracy which let's be real government bureaucracy is shit to begin with uh and i don't think it's you know that there's a lot of you know this is much like the, the gay marriage thing when you actually get into the nuts and bolts of like how how this massive bureaucracy works and how you navigate it there's a lot of stuff which people don't understand you know if you're not involved in that process um so i mean like the statutory declaration thing i mean i don't see any reason why it should be any harder than that like i mean previously like i mean certainly for some aspects of gender reassignment and and treatment and all this kind of stuff you had to go through the high court 
you know, to to get permission from the court, you know, I mean, if you're 16 and you want to transition and you have to find hundreds of thousands of dollars to have your gender changed on, you know... But well, we're to, not talking like, about like that that's, here. Well, well, in this case, it's changing it to a statutory declaration, which is great. I mean, that's... I don't see any reason why that's... I think what that's... you're referring to is... Are you referring to the the, uh, the court decisions about uh, hormone therapy for young people? Is yeah, that what you're so, referring so to? prior to... I can't remember the exact date, but there was there was two landmark cases in the last... I think it's five years or so, where the where essentially the, like, the court said, okay, we're, we're going to make this easier. Like, And I mean, these people were involving... I think it was involving prepubescent uh, kids who wanted to transition before puberty set it. Because obviously, if you hit puberty... You know, it becomes a lot harder to transition. So there, there was some complexity compared to, a, say, a 16-year-old. But, I mean, that, that gives you an idea of how difficult it used to be. Uh, and I'd suspect most people who would even oppose this kind of stuff wouldn't want that it to be that hard. Maybe there's some who do. But, like... There's a happy medium, though. That's, that's, that's what I'm advocating for, that this self-identification of policy that seems to uh want, want to be enacted by the or the current uh trans lobby is open to abuse and mockery as barry o'sullivan showed uh just last week well that's because people like barry o'sullivan have no respect for what those people for what trans people think really i mean maybe some you know some people who would agree with him but uh, you know I, I think that's that's why they get mocked like i don't think it's because there's anything inherently mocked like worthy of mocking in in what they're doing. Like I mean, just again to go back to the stat deck thing because I think that is, I mean, that seems to be to be the best aspect of this legislation. Um, so what if you change? I mean, there, there's very few things like which actually require a birth certificate, uh, and of which gender would be consequential. Like in in va the vast majority of cases, like if it just if it just if we lived in a world where it did not ever occur to anybody to put gender on or even sex on a birth certificate. What would what would it matter? I mean, most of the things that require identification often require a birth certificate and a driver's license or a passport, like some visual, like an ID, like a you know a photo ID, for good reasons. Because what you look like is what really matters. It doesn't matter what the paperwork says. Like, I could bring a, a, a birth certificate saying I'm Tim Wilms. They don't know me from you know they wouldn't know that I'm pretending to be you. But if I bring photo IDs that doesn't look like your photo ID, well then they realise. So, I mean, I can kind of see where. You, some of what where you're coming from, but I think I think it's in this example, it's pretty overblown. Well, gender is no longer on um, birth, uh, sorry, driver's licenses or uh, key cards, um, or because it, I there, there was a lot of people who got outraged about Queensland removing it, but they were just following other states. Sure, I, yeah. I, I I didn't see the the big deal because you don't you. We're not in Saudi Arabia. We don't yeah. need to know yeah. uh, if it's a male or female uh, driving the car. Yeah. Um, but I, it's a birth certificate because it is well, birth. It it describes how you are born. That's that's obviously why it has gender on it. But yeah, if if gender doesn't need to be on something, then yeah, I don't see the need to to have it. But. Sure. The, the reason why I oppose the, the simple stat deck is because, well, basically to properly transition gender, you have to go through counselling and yeah. doctors have to, have to approve because it's important to have the, the safeguard processes because, as we know, um, with, with, with children, they can uh, display gender confusion early yeah. in life, but they... Well, they I mean, I think that's, like, life. before 16. Like, I think by the time you're 16, it's... from no not a medical expert. Somebody could correct me, but I think, I think by sixteen, you've probably got it sorted. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem with the the sixteen um, thing, but yeah, I, I still think that the there, there should be some to to change your your gender on the birth certificate. There should be letters from a doctor or a psychologist to basically uh, affirm this that yes, they are, are undergoing a proper um in transition so that and uh, so we don't have uh, absurd situations which i agree are rare but we have safeguards and everything to to make sure that you know we don't have these ludicrous 
uh, cases and also to, to safeguard against the, the welfare of the person who is transitioning to make sure that they are making the, the right decision. Okay, well, we've almost out of time. There's so, always so much more to talk about. Uh, there's always, I, I have to say, I miss having you on, Tim. It's great. Uh, tell us about The Unshackled. Tell us, like, you uh, before we started, you talk about publishing six times a week. So you guys got a lot of stuff coming out. Uh, web, obviously, if they look at the video, they can see theunshackled.net. But tell us a bit about what's uh, w where they can find your content and what sort of content you put out. Oh, oh it's, the, the Unshackled is we try to encompass as much of the, the broad right as possible. So conservative, libertarian, nationalists, we like to give a voice to, to those who are often misrepresented or simply ignored by the, the mainstream media. Uh, so we go to... Uh, events in Melbourne, protests and that to to uh, capture, you know, what really goes on in that. And often we see the the mainstream reports on the on the evening news, and they're they're totally different from what we actually uh, saw on the ground. And also, um, there's also so much uh, misinformation about the the mainstream media's perception of of certain groups and that, and they get. Uh, like, for example, we've been covering a lot of um, the demonization of the Proud Boys, for example, and now they're, they're called this evil, uh, violent hate group. And of course, if you actually bother to read their, their manifesto, it's actually uh, a libertarian manifesto. So to give a more concrete example, we've been go uh, going, you know, asking Proud Boys themselves, going to, to the source, uh, because they've been a deep platform from Facebook and other platforms about what is the the truth of the matter and simply uh, reporting that without their their hyperbolic uh, language and we found uh, this is why we've been able to grow so significantly is because people are refreshed that they're they're not just getting a journalist's cartoonish version of uh, what one group is they're, they're they're actually getting a proper factual report. All right. Well, if it, that anybody's listening, if that's late to your vote, theunshackled.net, they have tons of stuff. Every time I look at the YouTube channel, there's like 50 gazillion more videos. They really, uh, uh, Tim and his crew are prolific. Uh, so thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, Tim, again, for joining us. And we'll be back again next week.